Hello, this is Beth Holtzman with UVM Extension's New Farmer Project, and we're back with Julia Shanks to continue talking about bookkeeping basics for farm businesses. Hi, thank you. Um, so we're going to get started with our overview of QuickBooks, and we're going to talk about uh, desktop versus online. We're going to talk about the language of QuickBooks, and then finally we're going to talk about setting up your chart of accounts. And I want to just address the elephant in the room first, because there's always a big question about the difference between online and desktop. And when you're ready to get started, you know, if you're thinking about QuickBooks or you're using QuickBooks and you're not sure which one is better and we're trying to sell you on online, I uh, just want to go over a uh, overview of the differences between the two. So the first part is the cost. So with the online system, you're going to be paying a monthly fee. It's a monthly subscription and it can range depending on the version that you choose. It's going to be $35 to $70 per month, which can be, you know, up to $840 a year. If you get the desktop version, it's a one-time cost depending on if you can find a sale or not. It's the full cost is $300, but Oftentimes you can find it for $200 and this is a one-time cost. So once you buy the software, you download it onto your computer and unless you buy a new computer, you do not need to upgrade every year. If you have the online version, you can only have one enterprise at a time. And if you have the desktop version, you can have multiple enterprises. So I'll give you an example in my personal life. Um, I, you know, obviously I have my business, the farmer's office. I also have a separate company, a different enterprise for my personal finances. So I keep my personal and my business finances separate. Um, so I can have separate companies. And I also manage my parents' financials. So I have a separate company for them. Now, if I were to be doing this in the online version, I would need to have a $35, $70, dollars subscription for each of those different enterprises. Um, you know, I'm working with a client right now who has a farm business and a restaurant business and they're separate entities. And if you're online, you're going to need a separate subscription for each of those entities. Whereas if you're on the desktop, you can have multiple companies. That said, with the desktop version, the desktop version is living on your desk. So if your desk is at home and you're at the farm and you pay for something, you have to wait until you get home to your desk to enter in the transaction. If you're using QuickBooks Online, you just log into the computer wherever you are. If there's an internet connection, you can enter transactions. You can download the app to your phone. So if, if you're at the hardware store or at the gas station, you can just enter things on the go. And to that end, because it's in the cloud, it makes collaboration much easier. So if your accountant wants to get into your QuickBooks to see what's going on, or maybe you have one person on your staff taking care of expenses and one person on your staff taking care of revenue, it makes it a lot easier to collaborate. Because it's in the internet, it can actually be a little bit slower. And especially for farmers that live in rural areas where internet is not quite as robust as it is in more urban areas, that speed can really um, get you down. It gets me down, I'll be honest with you. And Further, each transaction, every time you hit enter, it needs to upload into the cloud and then refresh the page. So it just generally slows things down on the online version. And I find that the reporting on the desktop version is a little bit more robust. Now, I, and I'm sure it's obvious in my tone, I am partial to the desktop version, but I also recognize that online really is just much more practical for a lot of farmers, especially because of the collaborative capacity that, you know, you can, you can log in from a multiple computers, you can share, you can get help. Um, you can have multiple people accessing your QuickBooks. And so this is, can be more important than any of the other benefits of the desktop version. So obviously decide which one works best for you, but understand that the two versions are different and these are how. One of the things that makes QuickBooks really frustrating to get started with is that QuickBooks has its own language. And as an example, you know, in English, we talk about paying a bill. It's like, oh, I got my Verizon bill in the mail and I'm gonna go pay it. 
paying a bill in QuickBooks has a very specific meaning. And in QuickBooks, you only pay a bill after you enter a bill. So if you don't enter a bill in QuickBooks, then you don't pay a bill. You just write a check. So there's some very deliberate, specific uses of each term. Uh, another example is debits and credits, and debits and credits is the bane of anyone's existence who's tried to get into accounting and just doesn't get it. It, you know, we think of debits as being decreases and credits and being, as being increases. And in QuickBooks and in general accounting, debits is the left column and credits is the right column. And it's irrelevant whether it's increase or decrease. It's, you know, it's more nuanced than that. And understanding these specific meanings, or even if you don't understand it, recognizing that there are specific meanings to each of these terms can help you get up to speed with QuickBooks um, more quickly. And then they get really fussy on you. They use different terms in different places for the same thing. So as an example, if you're making a deposit, um, it may say received from, which would be the customer. And if you're creating an invoice, it's not received from, it's the customer job. Or in another place, it might be name. So depending on what kind of transaction you're doing, whether it's a deposit or an invoice or an expense, it may look different. It might have different names. So you have to understand which ones are which. In some places, it says record deposit. In some place, it says make deposit. If you're using QuickBooks Online, it'll talk about products and services. And in the desktop version, it's items. And actually, this is an interesting point in terms of products and services versus items. If you go online and watch a video tutorial on QuickBooks, it's helpful to know whether you're looking at the desktop version or the online version because things are going to be a little bit different. Basic functionality is the same, but terms and where to find things are different. So it's really important to recognize that Things have different names and they have very specific names. So in the last section, we talked about setting up your chart of accounts and sort of the nomenclature, if you will, of your quick of your accounting system. How do you name things? And that structure is called the chart of accounts in QuickBooks. And how we create our chart of accounts directly impacts how we see our reports. So when we categorize something as income or expense, it's going to show up on our income statement. If we categorize something as a fixed asset or a loan, it's going to show up on our balance sheet. So these here are the types of accounts, um, and we'll get into that in a few minutes, what the types of accounts. These are the types of accounts, and then we can name the accounts and give them names that mean things to us. So as an example, for our revenue accounts, we need to decide, are we going to track our sales channel? So where did we sell it? Whether it was a farmer's market, a farm stand, co-op, CSA, or what did we sell? Did we sell beef, vegetables, dairy? And the reason why it's so important to pick one or the other is if you try to do a mashup of both, you're going to come home from the farmer's market and you're going to say, well, I sold um, some beef, some dairy and vegetables at the farmer's market. Do I categorize it as farmer's market sales or do I categorize it as beef, dairy, vegetable sales? So if you pick one or the other, you can then, you know, have a consistent system for tracking your revenue. And I will say, and we're not going to get into this today, but if you're intrigued to learn more, if you're using classes in QuickBooks, you can track the other side. So if you're using your revenue accounts to track your sales channel, you can use classes to also track the products that you sell. Then with the expenses, it's helpful to have parent categories and then children and grandchildren. So you have the primary accounts, which is gonna help keep things organized, and then you'll have the sub accounts. And I recommend the primary accounts as the cost of goods sold, direct operating, payroll, general and admin, repairs and maintenance, and occupancy. And then all the more detailed accounts, whether it's seeds and seedlings, fertilizers, salaries, insurance, those will get nested underneath the parent categories. And that's gonna ensure 
that when you run your, your reports, that like is categorized with like, so that you can see all of your direct operating expenses together, and you can see all of your payroll expenses together. So again, these are the account types. And here is a list of the chart of accounts. And we have the name, what it is, and the type tells us where it is. So we can see, for example, that under direct operating expenses, we have car and truck expenses, farm stand expenses, and this account type tells us where it's going to show up on our financial statement. So all of these expenses here are going to be on our income statement. Fixed assets right here is going to show up on our balance sheet. So when you go to create a new account, you're going to see, you know, QuickBooks may only show you a few accounts. So make sure that you look into other account types to see the full complement of account types. And this is especially important with other income and other expenses. And we talked about this in the last section that things like grants, we don't want to necessarily include that in our primary income category. We want to make sure that they're other income. So make sure that when you select your account types that you look for all of the different options. So in the last section, we talked about organizing our income statement for meaning, and the account type is what's gonna give us that organizational structure. So our gross sales, what, whatever we call our gross sales, whether we call it farm stand sales, CSA sales, uh, beef sales or pork sales, the account type is income, and that's gonna make sure that it shows up on the top line. Our cost of goods sold as the account type, make sure that it shows up right below the revenue and above the gross profit. So any account that's typed as cost of goods sold is going to show up here. For the operating expenses, these are all going to be expenses and they're going to show up below gross profit and before the operating income. Things like grants or other income if you rent out Part of your barn or greenhouse to another farmer or you know you might have other income if the account type is other income it's going to show up below operating income and likewise other expenses are going to show up in this section as well so setting the account types is going to help you keep your income statement organized in a way that helps you extract meaning now, you can totally edit your chart of accounts. There is no reason why you can't go and rename or restructure things. So when you go to your chart of accounts in QuickBooks, you can click on edit and make things sub-accounts of other things to help you keep organized. If you have accounts that you don't use anymore, you can make them inactive. And this is especially important in terms of keeping consistent. You know, as an example, maybe you had a honey operation last year, you're not doing honey anymore. So you don't want to see any of the expenses associated with honey production. And making them inactive is going to keep you from accidentally categorizing something that you don't use anymore. And it's just going to be one more tool in helping you stay consistent. You can rename accounts that make sense for you. And I mentioned this earlier. When you originally set up QuickBooks, it may suggest account names for you. But, you know, if seeds and seedlings don't make sense for you, if you want to call seeds golden nuggets, by all means, rename it golden nuggets. Or you want to name your compost black gold, rename it black gold because that's what makes sense for you. And by renaming the accounts in a way that makes sense for you, again, it's going to help you be consistent. You're going to remember how things get entered in. If it doesn't make sense to you, it's like, wait, did it, was it compost or was it soil amendments? And you might end up having two categories for essentially the same thing. And to that end, if you end up having two categories for the same thing, you may want to merge them. So if you look at your QuickBooks and you're like, oh shoot, I have, um, I have compost and I have uh, soil amendments and I really want to merge those two, you can rename them um, and that will, if you rename compost to soil amendments, it's the same as the other one, it's going to merge those two um, accounts. 
And this will apply to all previous transactions. So if you've been running your QuickBooks and sometimes you enter soil amendments and sometimes you enter in compost and then you rename and merge, all the historical transactions will be renamed as well. So don't worry about having to go back and change you know, 27,000 individual transactions. You can just rename one account and it'll apply to everything. And it's really helpful to look at your profit and loss in your balance sheet to make things, to ensure things look the way you want. The profit and loss in balance sheet, your financial statements, are a direct manifestation of how your chart of accounts is set up. So if you run your profit and loss and you're like, oh God, I really wish that this account was nested under there, go back and edit that account and make it a sub account, rename, move things around, make sure that it looks the way you want it to. It's just going to be that much easier when you run reports to get the information you need. And finally, as, much, as best as you can, align revenue categories with expense categories, but make sure you have separate account names. So, you know, if you have uh, beef revenue, you want to have expenses associated with beef production. If you have vegetable revenue, you want to have expenses associated with vegetable production but make sure that the names are different enough so that you don't accidentally enter in an expense as a revenue and vice versa. So things that you wanna do on a regular basis, and I say daily-ish, it really depends on the size and scope of your business. If, you know, February, you don't have a lot going on, you know, once a week is probably enough. In July and August, when you're kicking booty, you're going to want to do things more often. And, you know, it really, you know, it's hard to imagine when you're super duper busy in July and August that you're going to have time to do your bookkeeping. But the more regularly you keep up with your bookkeeping, the more easily you can pivot. And, you know, you can look at your books and say, how am I doing? Am I hitting my sales goals? Um, you know, if you created a budget and you want to see, you know, am I hitting my budget? I projected all of this revenue and I projected all of these expenses. If you're entering in your revenue and your expenses on a regular basis, you can quickly look and see. And if you're falling short, you have a chance to make an adjustment. If you don't enter in your uh, revenue and expenses until the end of the month, then you potentially lose three weeks of opportunities to make corrective measures. So daily-ish, uh, depending on the season, uh, you want to record your expenses, so you know, empty out your wallet, all of your receipts, uh, get them into your record keeping system, log all of your invoices to customers. So if you made a wholesale delivery run, make sure you log the invoices. And this is actually really important because logging your invoices is going to help you track who's paid and who has not paid. And if you haven't logged your invoices, you may not realize somebody's more than 30 days behind in paying you. And you don't want that to happen. So you want to be able to track who's paid you and if they're paying you on time. So log your invoices to your customers. Likewise, if, if you receive payment, you want to make sure that you note that so you don't accidentally hound a customer that paid you because you thought they hadn't because you didn't record it. And then obviously you want to record all your sales and revenue and any other deposits. So those are things that you want to do on a regular basis. Certainly on a monthly, quarterly basis, you'll want to run reports and review the numbers. And we'll talk about some of the analysis that you can do in the next section. Now, obviously, this was a very quick brush on QuickBooks. If you want more support on QuickBooks, you can go to the farmer's office. I've got some videos there. The Carrot Project also has a lot of videos. I know that UVM offers some classes and support, so uh, certainly get in touch with um, Beth, or if you want to get in touch with Kelly over at UNH, I know that they've got some resources as well. So in the next section, we're going to talk about what to do with the numbers, the output. Um, and again, feel free to be in touch with Kelly, Beth, or myself if you need more support. And thank you. <laughs>